Okay, we are holding over here in Tehillim, and we're in Memches number 48. We're starting a new one today. I think we will see, we might even finish the entire one today as well. So in, in Rafoy's introduction to this particular Tehillim, he has some very beautiful ideas to put us in the right frame of mind to understand what's being said. <clears throat> and once again, we have a Tehillim that is written by the Bnei Korach, by the sons of Korach, and we'll see why it's so significant. So he speaks about over here that if you, when we see the words, as we go through the Pesukim together, we'll see that David HaMelech, or the sons of Korach, are describing the future glory of Yushalayim that is going to happen eventually, as Hashem, as even though that right now we find that the city of Jerusalem is lying in ruins. And the reconstruction of Yushalayim is not going to be some kind of architectural feat, says Rafoya. Rather, it's going to be restoring the sacred city, and it will signal a new era of Mashiach, of Shleimus, of perfection, the way that the world is supposed to look. And he says that we're going to be like children that are coming back to their father's home, which of course is Hashem. And it's going to give us a whole new energy and a vitality to lift up our souls than we ever had before. So writes for the following, that this psalm, till the number 48, is every day at the end of davening. I'm not sure that all of the women say, but at the end of davening, there's something called Shir Shel Yom. There's this song of the day. The song of the day for the second day of the week is this song over here. And the reason is because this is the song of the, that signifies the second day of creation. And the second day of creation is when HaKadosh Baruch is separated between the Shemayim and the Aretz, the heavens and the earth. That means the heavenly and the earthly components of the universe. Hashem made this ruling in the, in the heavens and there's ruling down here on the earth. So since that this Tehillim is read on the second day of the week, which signifies and connotes the second day of creation. So there must be something over here about creation on the second day that is going to speak about this division that we are describing. So he writes like this, that in the Midrash it says the following, that on the second day of creation, HaKadosh Baruch created something called Machlekes, which is literally is strife, it's division, it is schism, it is argument, arguments between people because the upper and the lower waters were separated against their will and therefore there was division, there was machlekes that was started here in this world. Now this is a very important point of the nature of the Olam Hazer world, this physical world that we are living in, that this is a world that to a great extent is, is based upon and founded upon machlekes, there are things, there is division in this world. The maral, the way that the maral explains it is, is that the world itself is made up of so many different elements and aspects, even though that HaKadosh Baruch created the world in such a way that everything is, everything uh, works together in symmetry, Nevertheless, because of there are so many opposing forces in the, in the world, the world itself lends itself to having a, re, having a reality of machlekes, of argument. Which means, don't be surprised when there are machlekes and when there are arguments that break out between people. Don't be surprised when we live in a world we see with our own eyes probably more than any other generation because of the over exposure of the media and everything that takes place, there is so much strife and there is so much disagreement that takes place in the world in every little thing that you could possibly imagine from the most basic things, you know, it's the, we get called often for uh, references as shaduchim, and the questions that people ask are so ludicrous has nothing at all to do with the, the young man and the young woman of what's going to make the best husband and the best wife. But there are things that are ingrained in people's subconscious or their conscious that these are the things that are important and therefore creates the division that is there. 
the country is divided, politics are divided, health is divided, vaccines, masks, you name it, everything is divided. And why is that? Because the world itself in its foundationary stages is a world which lends itself towards division. As Rebbeinu Bechayi explains over here, that the division which HaKadosh Baruch Hu made in the world on the second day of creation ends up being the root of all of the subsequent strife and machlekes and arguments and division that the, the world will ever have in the future. And he says, if you look in the Gemara, the Gemara says that if someone is born on the second day of the week, so it's pretty much guaranteed that they're going to have a bad temper. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm about to go check all my children's births right now to see which days they were born on. Okay, but he, the Gemara says that a person that is born on the second day of the week, which is Monday, so then the, it's almost guaranteed that they're going to be ill-tempered. Why? Because on the second day of the week is when HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he divided the waters from there's the upper waters and the lower waters. That's division. That means that a person that is born on a Monday, he has inherently enemies connected to the creation of the world. And in that creation is the world that division was started. What is a, we know that most arguments and most strife is started by people that have bad tempers. And therefore, it's almost a given, says the Gemara, that's how it's going to be. Says Rashi on that Gemara over there, that since that he has a bad temper, as we're saying, since that he's a kaisen, he's an angry person, he's got bad temper, that's why he's going to be divided, which means he's going to estrange himself from other people. The person with a bad temper, nobody wants to be around people with bad tempers. Nobody enjoys that. It's, it's suffocating, it's annoying, it's, it's taxing on a person. Nobody likes to be in the company of somebody with a bad temper. Everybody knows that, the whole world knows that. That's why Mr. Donald J. Trump was so unfavorable in the eyes of so many people, because he has a temper. Now his temper got him very far in this world because he didn't take no for an answer and everything, but half the country was divided against him. So we understand that the people that have tempers, the people that get mad, the people that do things, with the temper, they are creating division between themselves and others, and therefore they are, they, it says, says it in Bechaya, according to Gemara over here, it's, it's a person who's linked into the second day of creation. He's almost, you know, he, he could work on himself. He could learn how to control his bad temper. Maybe that is going to be his avayda, his tikkunim that he has to make on himself in this world, but it's part and parcel of his DNA. There's another sefer that he quotes over here called Vesisei Laila. I believe that is of Tzadok HaKayin. And he explains over here the following. And that is that the division between the heaven and the earth initiated the eternal strife between the physical and the spiritual. Heaven, Shemayim, is Ruchnius, and Aretz, the earth, is Gashmi, is physical. And therefore, he, and, and that's the whole machlekes, that's the whole strife that exists in the world, and that's who Klal Yisrael is. Klal Yisrael, like every human being, is a composite of the body and the soul. It's just that we look at ourselves differently than everybody else. The whole world, which is Grecian ideology, looks at body and soul as two separate entities. They're not necessarily a steer, a contradiction to each other. The, the soul can have what the soul wants, and the body can have what the body wants. Famous stories of, I believe it was Aristotle, he would finish giving one of his long-winded drushes in the base Midrash, and he would talk about the loftiest heights that the soul could possibly reach, and then later that day they would find him walking out of the house of prostitution. And they would say, Aristotle, aren't you the one who just told us all of these great things about the spirit and the soul and the holiness? He said, yes, in the base of Midrash, I'm Aristotle the soul man. When I'm outside on the streets, I'm Aristotle, the body man. What's the contradiction? There's no contradiction. Bertrand Russell, if I'm not mistaken, was the famous logician. Logician is such a word. He's a famous person of ethics in college. And he was also a, a, uh, he was also a philosopher. 
and he was once caught having an affair with one of his students. So they brought him in to the room, that in, into the Hanhala, into the, 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 uh, the officiating people over there in the college university to grill him and ask him, how could you do such a thing? You are the professor of logic. You're the professor of ethics, of morals. How do you do such a thing? And he said, and if I was a math teacher, I'd have to be an isosceles triangle? Just because I teach something doesn't mean that I have to follow through with it. So that's the world at large. The world at large is a world where body and soul exist in two different vacuums. You do whatever the soul wants when the soul wants, and you do what the body wants when the body wants. Cloud yourself is a different entity. We're a different shape and form. We are a nation that understands that there is body and there is soul, but the two of them exist and they, li- and they exist together. And the body cannot be left to run after its desires, otherwise the soul will be compressed in this world. On the other hand, the neshama goes inside of the goof, inside the body, and drives and runs the way in which the body is supposed to, to be able to behave in this world as a vehicle to allow me to fulfill the desires of my neshama because as we mentioned hundreds of times probably over the years that the world to perform the mitzvahs, the place to perform mitzvahs is here in the physical world. Without a body, without physicality, you cannot do the mitzvahs and therefore we need the physical in order that we could be able to express the desires of the ruchni of the spiritual. But says the Rasi Laila that this division of Shemaim Va'aretz on the second day of creation, so it creates an eternal strife between the spiritual and the physical. And therefore, it only makes sense that this particular Tehillim, which is written by B'nai Karach, by the sons of Karach, is going to be recited on the second day of the week, which is, which is parallel to the second day of creation, because the original instigator of strife, meaning that which we find in the Torah, the greatest, uh, the greatest, or the, I will call it the worst event of strife ever, was Korach versus Moshe Rabbeinu. Korach began to make a argument against Moshe that Moshe was taking too much of the power of the Jewish people to himself and to his direct family and descendants. And Korach came along and said, we're not going to take that. We also want some cover, we also want some honor, we also want to be considered to be great people. And it was a very big mistake as we know. Now according to the Zayar, when did Karach's children write this particular Tehillim? So the Zayar says that while they were tottering, I think it's really teetering, on the brink, when they were teetering on the brink of Gehenna, which means they were falling down the pit, as we mentioned many times, and they were about to go down into the abyss that we would call Gehenna, like the rest, like Korach and the rest of all of his cronies over there. Had they not done tshuva at that moment, then of course they would have fallen down with everybody else. However, they did do tshuva, and a cleft broke out from the side of the abyss over there, and they, they landed on that cleft, and they were rescued and they were saved. So therefore, the, the, uh, the children of Korach, who were part of the strife, but they realize at the end of the day that if you just focus in on Hashem, you'll avoid the strife. That's really what it's all about. If everybody would just, well, it's almost an impossibility in the world today, but if everybody would have a similar outlook on life and what is important and what is valuable, it's interesting we find, because we find in the Parsha of last week, we spoke about it a little bit on Shabbos, but just to make it in a deeper way, you find that Yosef HaTzadik did not make a big deal to his brothers after he reveals himself. He could have made things very painful for them and he could have complained against them, but he decided not to because he recognized that everything is from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everything is from Hashem. Yaakov Avinu, his, the brothers come, to his children come and they say, by the way, Yosef is alive. And it says at first he doesn't believe them. Now he has every reason not to believe them because for 22 years he's been under the impression 
as his children said, that Yosef, a wild animal, came and ate him up alive and attacked him. And there was no, I mean, no remains, no bones, no flesh, nothing, only the coat. That's all that was left. So for 22 years, his children have been telling him, at least that he should be under the impression that his son is, is dead. And we find in the Torah, or we don't find in the Torah, that after he finally believes that they're alive and they're coming down to Mitzrayim, we don't find any conversation between Yaakov and his children what happened the last 22 years. There's not even a rebuke, there's not even a question, there's no dialogue as they're walking down the Mitzrayim. It wasn't like a day's trip, it was a long trip. He could have said, so like, what happened 22 years ago? What, what did you do? What, I mean, did Yosef, you told me he died, he didn't really die, you didn't know he didn't die? There's nothing over there. And, and Rashi points out that when Yaakov Avinu meets Yosef for the first time, when Yaakov meets Yosef for the first time, so it says that Yosef falls on the neck of Yaakov and he begins crying, but Yaakov is not crying. And so, oh, the Rashi says, why wasn't Yaakov crying? I mean, this is like the moment he's been waiting for 22 years. Why is he not crying? And the answer is because he was saying Shema. Why he's saying Shema? If he's saying Shema, so Yosef should also be saying Shema. Is that the opportune time to say Shema? And the answer is, as the Maral explains over there, no, the, the point is, is that Yosef came, and when Yaakov Avinu saw that Yosef rode in on the, on, the, on the royal chariot, and he's the king over Mitzrayim, and his face is still shining with the Kedusha of Yosef that he was 22 years ago, suddenly Yaakov realized all of the worrying, those 22 years, 22 years of depression, the Gemara says that the Shechina left Yaakov Avinu for 22 years because he was in depression, that his son Yosef died, he wasn't macabre, he didn't accept it 100%. All of this that he went through the last 22 years, it was all for naught. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu was running the world perfectly, controlling everything exactly the way that it's supposed to be. And therefore he was expressing his gratitude to Hashem that he did everything in precision and perfection. And he's saying, thank you Hashem for everything you did the last 22 years of my pain and suffering. If only I would have seen it differently, I wouldn't have suffered. But now that I see that you were masterminding everything, I have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, nothing to feel bad about. It's all you Hashem. So even Yaakov Avinu, at the end, when he finally sees Yosef, he realizes that it's all the Rebbeinah Shalom. So why should I start out with my kids right now? But does it matter why they lied? Does it matter what really happened to Yosef? It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, everything worked out perfectly. So when you live in a world of Hashem's world, when you go above the, the inertia of this world where we want to get our own emotions and everything involved and fight against people and argue with people, we have to be right and they have to be wrong. So then you have machlaikis, you have strife. But when you live in the world of Hashem, when you're trying to do His will and you're able to see that everything is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, all of the arguments, everything begins to, it begins to fall away by the wayside. And that's why he writes that the, that the, the Gemara says that on the second day of creation, it doesn't say ki taif. On every day of creation it says, and it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. Except on Monday. In that day of creation it does not say ki taif, it doesn't say it was good. Why? Because on that day, the fires of Gehenim were created, and therefore the Zohar writes, therefore, and the, therefore the Gemara is saying that on that day, when there's the, and that's very telling, that strife, fighting, arguments, all of these things that people get themselves involved in, which normally will emanate from some kind of cause, some kind of anger and ill-tempered, like the Gemara says, that's where the fires of Gehenna, of that lower world, that's where they will consume the person. Strife is, as the Rambam, the Rambam wrote a letter to his son, and he said, I never saw a city, nor did I see a, kah a kahila, nor did I see a town that somehow did not get enveloped in the fires of machlekes. It's almost an impossibility. If a, if a person goes a lifetime without ever even being on the peripheral of the fires of machlekes, it's like a nace, it's an open miracle because it's, it's so likely to happen. And therefore, in the second day of creation was when the, the fires of Gehenna were started, 
And it's because of the division which brought about strife into the world. And therefore, the, the Zohar writes over here that it's only appropriate that this psalm is sung on the second day of the week because it has all of these connotations that are there. That is the introduction to this one. So we'll see that the Mephoshim are a little more sparse, perhaps, uh, on this deal. And that's why we'll try to get as far as we can get. Maybe today, maybe we'll even finish. So the, so the, it says over in the, in the beginning, Shir Mizmor Levnei Korach, once again, this is a song that the sons of Korach are singing. And it says like this, God Hashem, Umehula Me'oi, great is Hashem, Umehula Me'oi, and he is very praised, he's very praised. That's one way to look at these words. Be'ir Elokeinu, in the city of God, Har Kodshoi, his holy mountain. Obviously, the city of God is, of course, is Yushalayim in the Har Kotcho, his mountain of holiness is the Har Habayis, is the mountain where the Beis Amigdash stands. Says the Malbim on these opening words, Not every great person or great thing is, is worthy of the praise that it receives. Why? Why? Because sometimes a person gets, is so great, so they reach a level of haughtiness, and they don't recognize the shvalim, the low people that are beneath them. And therefore their deeds are not going to truly be uh, praised in all of the sha'arim, all of the gates of everybody, because they see this person, he might be great in this area, but he forgot about where he came from. It's like the it's like the, the news always loves to tell the stories of the, 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 the poor black child from the inner city who was raised amongst crime and poverty and drugs and he didn't know who his father was or his mother was. And he goes on and at a young age he realizes that he doesn't have to be trapped into the, into the persona of what everybody would think is going to happen to him. And he rises up and he goes to school and he becomes, he becomes a big businessman or a doctor or a lawyer or an entertainer or, or a ball player, whatever it is. And he goes and he never forgets where he came from. He never forgets his roots. He never forgets his neighborhood. He goes and he gives back to the kids in the inner city and he comes down to their level and he plays with them and he talks to them and he gives them money and he pays scholarships and all those things. But if the guy goes off and he becomes a multi multi-millionaire celebrity personality and he never gives back and he never remembers, so those kids, they say, well, that's what's going to happen to me. I'll become this hardy guy. I'll just become this big wig and I'll forget about everybody else. He doesn't get all the praise in every single area. But HaKadosh Baruch is not like that. In the exact place where HaKadosh Baruch Hu's greatness is expressed, you will also find the humility of Hashem. In the greatness, in the loftiness of the Rebbeinu Shailam, you will find HaKadosh Baruch Hu's humility. On one hand, He is great on His own, but the reason that he is praised by everyone is because he comes down to this world and he washes over the entire creation. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, try getting to the President of the United States. You cannot reach the President. You call him up, you're, not gonna, you're never going to get through. You send him a letter, maybe somebody in his office will send you a letter six months down the road. The president thanks you for your kind words, and he doesn't have time at this point to, to get back to you in person. You'll never get to him. And yet, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in his infinite greatness that he has, he comes down to the world every single moment, and he's mashkiach, he's watching over each and every one of us, guiding our lives in perfection to make sure that everybody has exactly what they need. And therefore, even the lowliest of people like ourselves, we have no problem praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu for all that he does. And this, this uh, praising of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, is 
is even from those that are far away from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're down here in this world, we are able to praise Him. Ki mikarav yirishim alasai yesh lo gavul, v'lo yalu kolkach. So says the Malbim over here, that although that we can't really understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we can't be able to appreciate all the greatness of Hashem, but we see enough of the greatness that He comes down to the world and takes care of us, so we are willing and we are happy and we are ready and able to praise Him at all the times. So that's the Gedula. So that is the greatness that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, is, is being referred to over here. And the Rav Hirsch writes along these lines as well, but he says, Mahulal does not mean um, praising Hashem, Rather, it means that Hashem is great because He is clearly revealed by His mighty acts. Says Rav Hirsch, He is visible in His acts, the, he, the, the emanations that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings down to the world, makes it apparent to even the mortal man that Hashem exists, and that any thinking individual who looks at Hashem's beautiful, wondrous, amazing acts in this world, if he just uses his brain a little bit, he will begin to recognize HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And just like if you'd be in a, in a room and there would be darkness and the lights would be turned on, you'd recognize the existence of the light. So too, if a person looks carefully in this world around him, they will be zeich to see the manifestation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu all around. Now, where is that going to be seen most and foremost? That's what it's saying in this Tehillim over here. The place where the greatest revelation of Hashem will take place is Har Kodshoi, is on His mountain of holiness, of glory, which is the Har Abayis, which is the mountain where the Beis HaMikdash stands, and specifically when there is a Beis HaMikdash. We know that the building of the Mishkan, as Rav Hirsch himself explains in the Chumash, was a miraculous feat, it was a physical reality where Klal Yisro was able to harness all of their physicality for the sake of ruchni, for the sake of spiritual, to form an edifice in this world where the Shechina was going to feel comfortable to dwell completely. Meaning, of course, the Shechina dwells everywhere. The Divine Presence everywhere in the world. You, it's, it's everywhere. Hashem fills up every single nook and cranny of this world. But we wanted a place where we'd be able to go to any day of the week and see the Shechina completely manifested in the physical world. That was the Mishkan. That was the tabernacle that the Jewish people built in the desert. So they were able to take all of this chaymer, all of the physicality, all of the earthiness, elevate it to a level of Kedusha, of Ruchnias, and the Shechina came and dwelled there. Once we went into Eretz Yisrael, so there's no longer a need for a Mishkan, because then we built a permanent place, dwelling place called the Beis HaMikdash, the house of Mikdash, of Kedusha, of holiness. And in that place is where our Kodesh Baruch Hu was able to manifest himself. As the Mishnah in Pirkei tells us, that in the Beis HaMikdash there were ten open miracles which took place every single day. Why did Hashem need to make open miracles there? Because if you ever wanted to know that there is a Rebbein HaShayim, if you ever needed a little chizuk in your Amuna, you wanted to see the, the fingerprints of the Shechin in this world, you walked in there and you saw a world that was Lamailim and Ateva above the regular laws of nature that we are living in in this world. And therefore the Beis HaMikdash was a miraculous, holy place that allowed for the Shechina to be able to dwell in a, very, in a very deep and very sincere way. So says the says Rav Hirsch, and the Olim of Hirsch are speaking about over here the following idea. And that is that if you want to come to the place where the Shechina is going to be seen at the, in, his, in his most uh, favorable appearance, that is going to be in Yerushalayim. And of course, if the Beis Amin is lying in ruins, and Jerusalem is destroyed, meaning even though it's been, there's building going on in Yerushalayim like you've never seen before, that's not the building that we're talking about. <laughs> Another fancy apartment in Yerushalayim for the Americans that want to go and live in Eretz Yisrael, that's not the building that we are discussing. Another train and another mall and another kosher restaurant that's serving quality meat, that's not what the building of Yerushalayim is really all about. The real building of Yerushalayim is when 
the Beis HaMikdash is going to be built once again, that is when the Shlemus, that is when, like, that is when the completion is going to come. That's why Yerushalayim is a language of Shalim, of completion. Yerushalayim is the place that is complete. It's the place where Klau Yisrael comes together as one. It's the place where the Shekhinah manifests and expresses itself and reveals itself like no other place in the world. When that will happen, this harmonious gathering of the Jewish people, once again, that is when the world will be back in its, in its world of perfection. Now Rashi writes over here on the next verse, the we forget that there's Rashi and Dylan, we're so busy with all the other Mepharshim, we forget that before the Rav Hirsch and before the Malbim, Rashi actually gave a commentary on all of Dylan. And he says like this, it says, Yefei Noif, that's Gimel, right? He says, he says, Yefei Noif, Misois Kola Aretz. It says that it's a beautiful view and it's the, the joy of the land. Har Tzion, which is the mountain of Tzion, this is the Temple Mount. Yarkis Eit Tzofayin, Kiryas Melech Rav, the sides of the northern, the northern side of, of the, the northern side of, which here we're going to see is the Mizbeach, it's the city of the great king. Says Rashi the following, Umahi Misusa Yarkesei Tzofayin, what is the joy, what is the celebration that takes place in the Yarkesei Tzofayin on the northern sides of of the Beis HaMikdash. Says Rashi, Yerech HaMizbeach Safayna, on the northern side of the Mizbeach, of the altar, Shesham Shoichedin Chatois V'Hashamais, that was the side on the altar where they would shech, they would slaughter the korbanos, the sacrifices, the korban chatos and hashamas, the sin offerings that the Jewish people would bring. Umisha Ya'atsev, a person that was despondent because of the averas, because of the sins that were in his hands that he had committed. He would come to Yerushalayim. He would then bring a korban, a chatas, or an asham, which were the korbanas that were brought to bring atonement to a person. And lo and behold, the, the, the miracle of a korban was you brought an animal, you, ta- you took it into the base of Migdash, you put your hands on the animal, and you said, This really should be me that's going through all of this right now. It should be my slaughtering, it should be my blood, it should be my end, my demise because of the sins that I did. A, a sin is not a small thing. When a person is a chaitan, when a person sins to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they're affecting worlds and worlds and worlds. It's a damage, it's a disgrace to the king himself. So if I sinned, I should be walking around a wreck that I did. How could I do such a thing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? But then I bring the korban chatas into the Beis HaMikdash, and they shecht it over there on the altar. And I'm forgiven for what I did wrong. When the person leaves the Beis Hamidah, she rejoiced, he was happy. The Aideh Korbanais, Toiva Ba, because through the sacrifice, all of this good came to him. Says Rashi over here, that's the joy of Yushalayim. Yushalayim was not just a joy because the Beis Hamidah was there, and because there were Kohanim that were singing, and that were doing uh, Aveda, and the, and the Levim were singing their songs, and it was a great place to come for Sukkot and Pesach, it was the, the best hotel you could imagine. The real simcha of Yushalayim, says Rashi, was if you did something wrong, you had a way to absolve yourself from the sin. And you knew that it worked. See, we do tshuva down here in this world. We never know if we do enough tshuva. A person is a chayt, like Rabbi Yana writes, that you could never trust yourself that you did enough tshuva because you might not recognize how severe the sin is that you committed. So even if you did tshuva and you cried and you feel bad, how do you know that you did ample amount of tshuva for the sin that you committed? You might not understand how detrimental that sin was. But when there was a base HaMikdash, and you could bring korbanais, and you could bring the sacrifice there, and the kahanim were there leading you through the way, 
and it was a very intense environment that was going on, and you were busy with your hands on the animal, and you realized, this is me, it should be me, and you're crying, you're doing tshuva, and you're saying, I'm sorry Hashem, I won't do it again. And then they shecht and they sprinkle the blood over there, and, and this goes up again, the whole thing gets burned on the altar. So then you know your tshuva was accepted. What a great simcha. What a great joy. I know that I have nothing there's no blemish anymore on my scorecard. I'm clean as a whistle right now. I can go back to my house. I go back to my life. And I have no worries on my mind anymore about being a chayt, about being a sinner. That's the simcha, says Rashi over here, which took place in Eretz so and specifically in Yerushalayim, specifically in the base of Mignosh, by the altar over there, because that is, that is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought uh, that is what that is the joy that was brought to Klal Yisrael. So we'll go on a little bit more in the Mefarshim <clears throat> and Rashi. We'll go further in Rashi. Rashi says in I'm, I'm skipping quite a bit over here in in this. I'm going over here to Yud and it says Diminu Elokim Chazdecha that Hashem we have we have conceived we have recognized your Chesed your mercy. As being in the midst of your temple. Says Rashi over here, The Navi, he calls him a Navi. This is the children of the children of Korach. He goes and he's Mispalu, he davens to Hashem and he says, Dimino We we envision and kivino we are hoping for. El Chazdecha, your great mercy, your great kindness, Liros Chuasecha, Zubekeve Chalecha, to see your salvation in the Keve Chalecha within your Hechel, within your sanctuary, within your sanctuary. Meaning this whole, this whole Tehillim, as Rashi's pointing out already towards the end is, we once had a Beis Migdash. We once had a place where you could come and you could absolve yourself, where you could come and you can gather as call you you could come and you could see the Shekhinah. When the Beis HaMikdash is lying in ruins, that means none of that is available. None of that is available. The Gemara even says, Rafael brings it down as well, there's a famous Gemara Baba Basra that, that says over here the following. And it says that when they first set up the schooling system, for the, for the children, they wanted it specifically to be in Yerushalayim. Why they wanted it to be in Yerushalayim? Maybe the kids were far away, it was a schlep to get over there. Why did they want it to be in Yerushalayim? You know why they said? Because if a child, a pure child, would come to Yerushalayim, Yerakadosh, when there was a Beis HaMikdash, and they would see the Kahanim doing their avoid, and they would hear these beautiful songs, the, the, the prophetic songs of the Levium. And they would see the Karbanas being brought, and they would see all the Kedusha, all the purity that was going on over there. Could you imagine what an impression it was going to make on the children of Klal Yisrael? And then they would be in that environment and they would see what it means to be a Jew, how lofty a person could be, how the great heights that we could reach. And it would give them the wherewithal to go and study with a heart's desire to learn and to progress and to go higher and higher and higher in their heights. And therefore, that's what it means. From Tzion, from the mountain of Hashem, from Yushalayim, that's where Torah emanates from. What does that mean? That means not that specifically the Torah is coming right out of the mountain, but it means the children will go to Tzion, they will go to Yerushalayim, they will see all of the Kedusha that is there, it will influence them in such a strong and a positive and powerful way. And then they will go on in their studies, in their growth as a Jew, as an Evan Hashem, it, they will take themselves to higher levels than they ever reached before. That's what we don't have today. We don't have that. There's, in, in the old city, I don't want to say chas v'chalila Lashon Hara about any part of Yerushalayim, we can't say Lashon Hara, but even within the walls of the old city, there's so much that's going on over there. You go in there, you think you're coming to the Holy... You are going, the Kaisal is just a stone throw away. But there's so much that's going on, the hustle and the bustle, the streets over there, and the stores, and, and the non-Jews, and the Arabs, and everything that's going on. You can't even... It's even hard to find kosher food sometimes in the old city. 
because you don't know th- this heksha and that one, and there is no heksha over here. And the Arab guy's telling you, come, 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 eat, it's fine. What are you talking about? It's hard to find. So the Yushalayim of old is not the Yushalayim of today. It's still much better than Tarzana. That's for sure. And if you go there, you will see a Kedusha that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. When you walk up to the stones of the Kaisel and you daven and you pour your heart, it's a different davening than when you're standing here. Even though, Baruch Hashem, it's a wonderful place to daven, but it's not the same. But whatever you accomplish and whatever you see, that whatever you feel in Yushalayim of today, just know it's, it's a minuscule fraction of the Kedusha that was there in the days of the Beis HaMignash. The Midrash tells us the reason that the Kaisel is such a heavenly place for Klal Yisrael is because when the Beis HaMignash is destroyed and the Shechina left Yushalayim, basically, it says a little bit remained. And the little bit of Shechina that remained in Yushalayim for, for all generations stayed on the Kaisel Maravi on the Western Wall. And that's it. It's only a little bit. It's not in full force. It's not walking to the base of Megish and see all the Kedushin that's there. There's a little remainder of the Shekhinah that, step, that stayed in the world and it's there on the Kaisal. And so when you go there and you dive in and you feel and you get in contact with your tefillah in a way that you can't dive in anybody else, just know whatever you're accomplishing, whatever you're feeling, whatever your levels you're reaching, it's only a little bit of what it used to be like. And then you could imagine to yourself what it must have been like to be in the base of Migdash. What it must have been like to daven in a place where there are tens of thousands of Yidin squished together like this. Everybody davening their hearts out to Hashem. And then when it was time to, to, to prostrate oneself, suddenly there was all the room in the world for everybody to be able to spread out without any, without any barriers. It was a different world altogether. Altogether it was a different world. And that's he's saying over here, Says Rashi, that's what the, the tefillah is about. This particular Tehillim, we know what we had. We know what was once in this world. We know the levels that we were able to accomplish and to achieve. We've lost all of that now. And we're hoping and we're waiting and we're praying that that once again is going to come into our midst. So Rav, Rav, Rav Gamliel Rabinovich writes over here in the, in the end of this Tehillim, the last Pasuk says the following. It says, um, because this is our God, forever and ever. He will lead us beyond death, which means that as we know that when Mashiach will come, it's going to usher in a whole new era of existence. And even the idea of Tchis HaMesim, that Hashem is going to bring back those that are no longer in this world. So even those that are no longer here, there's going, they're going to come back and they're going to be part of this, this resurgence and this renaissance of Yiddishkeit as well. But he says for us, the message is the following. Let's explain this verse in, in the following way. This is our God, forever. A person has to know clearly that Hashem is our God. Don't try, anyway, not to take your mind off of Hashem or this idea for even a regular, even for one moment. And the verse continues and it says, What does it mean over here that he will, he will lead us on Almus? So he quotes Rashi. And Rashi says over here, Rashi says, Uh, which is recording? Okay, Rashi says, la which means he leads us over death constantly. What does that mean? 
כי אדם צריך לחיות מתוך הכרה זו לעולם. A person must live his life with this recognition constantly that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Elokeinu. Umida zu tinagehu la'olam. And then this mida, this trait that a person lives with, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the God of the universe and He is Elokeinu, not just the God, He is our God, it will guide a person la'olam constantly through his life. Meaning, a little bit like we discussed in the very beginning, that once that a person is able to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is my God, and He, to Him alone, I, I ascribe all of the greatness, and to He alone, I will follow His pathways in life. So then you should know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Himself is going to come and He's going to lead you and guide you as well in your life. Meaning that if you are to him, I am to my beloved, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to me. If I live a life that in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows that I recognize who's the source of everything, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself will show you that he will guide and make sure that things turn out and work out for you. I just had on Thursday, I was um, driving a little bit recklessly apparently, and I was racing into... Schwartz's Bakery in the city to pick up the, the cookies and the rugelach before I had to go learn with somebody at 2 o'clock. And I, I was so proud of myself. I cheshbon out the time exactly the right way. And I, there's a long line of cars going straight and I see the left turn lane is wide open. So I zoom into the left turn lane. I turn left and I go speeding into the parking lot of Schwartz's Bakery in the city. I wasn't really paying that close of attention. The curb and the in the part and the driveway is not such a great way to see. And the next thing I know, I feel my car poof, bang into the curb really strong. And I pull into the parking space and I see flat tire, whatever, tire pressure low. And I look at my tires completely flat. Now it's 1.49 in the afternoon. I'm supposed to learn with one of my rebbeim at 2 o'clock in the koila, which is a five minute walk away. I come, I came there just to make everything work out. I pick up the uh, pick up the cakes and, and I put it in the, my trunk and I tell the people in the Schwartz Bakery my car is going to be here for a couple of hours I have to go teach I'll come back and take care of it afterwards I go and I learn I daven mincha I go to teach and now the way my schedule works out these days is I have to daven marv in the city so I don't miss marv in the valley so I have two classes and I have to then leave the class and then I have to figure out how AAA is going to come and give me a spare tire, change my tire. Anyway, to make a long story short, I finish teaching. I'm walking towards my car. I call AAA. They say, no problem. We'll be there by 5.05. 5.05 is not going to work for me because I have to dive in Marv. Marv is about 5.05. So they said, we'll be there between now and 5.05. I said, okay, fine. Shem, you know that I want to dive in Marv. That's it. I, just, I need to daven marv. Anyway, I really said, Hashem, you know, if I don't daven marv now, my wife is going to be stuck with the kids until I find a later marv, so please let me daven marv now. Anyway, lo and behold, for the first time in the history of my life with AAA, they came within seven minutes to change my tire. The guy is there, nice guy, pumps it up, puts on the spare tire. He's done by 4.58. He's done with my tire. I go, I dive in Marv, I get back in, I drive home, and everything works out. If you show HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I recognize Hashem, it's all you, even the flat tire, it's, I can't blame myself completely, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is have a flat tire, otherwise I would, anyway, it's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything is Hashem, so then the way that you live according to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is well, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is manhig, he will guide you as well, he'll bring the miraculous triple A man, and bring him within seven minutes, he'll change your tire, everything will work out exactly the right way. You'll be able to daven marav, you'll come home, and your wife will be satisfied. You're only ten minutes later than you usually are because you couldn't drive the freeway to drive the streets all the way home to get to the valley. And then you get a tire change the next day, everything works out. So that's what we're saying over here. When there will be a Yushalayim Yer Kaidish back in the world again, and that's the city of Shleimus of perfection, 
So then everything will come together once again for Klal Yisrael. The Kohanim, the Levim, Klal Yisrael, the Yisraelim. There will be a place to redeem ourselves, to do tshuva, to see HaKadosh Baruch to see the Shekhinah. As long as we don't have that right now, that always leaves us wanting and lacking something in this world. And therefore our tefillah, our tefillah is that I'll recognize HaKadosh Baruch the best that I possibly can in this world, but I know it's only, it's only a, a, a fraction of what it's supposed to be when HaKadosh Baruch will come back to Yishalayim, Yer HaKadosh, Bimheira Bihameinu. Okay, that's 48. We're holding by 49 starting next week. For those of you that are not in Yishalayim, Yer HaKadosh, next week, Okay, for those of you that are still here in Tarzana, California, so we'll, we'll hopefully, those of you that are on Zoom, I'm inviting you, please come. This room is, it's so empty. You don't know. I, re- I remember the olden days when there were like 15, 20 ladies used to come to the Shear, and now we're, we're down to a handful. Anybody who wants to join us once again, your, your presence is very much appreciated and needed. And Be'ez Hashem, we will once again continue next week in Tehillim. Mem test number 49. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.